JJ McCullough is a YouTuber and journalist from Vancouver, Canada. His weekly educational videos cover a wide variety of topics from current events to the history of pizza. He doesn't just regurgitate facts, but brings a distinct thesis to each video, enlightening audiences and making him, dare I say, one of Canada's living national treasures. Today we discuss his process, the importance of learning, and the reasons that he's a vegetarian. He is the first repeat guest on this podcast. I'm happy to share with you this conversation with JJ McCullough. Of course, like the first question I have for you is given the the situation in Martha's Vineyard, how have you uh, <laughs> <laughs> continued your... Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A little inside well, joke. Well, well, Charlie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did, you know, as I've been preparing to, uh, you know, do interviews, I have like thought about like, what would Charlie Rose say in this situation? Like he, cause he just kind of, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and it's usually not very good, so I don't do it. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> he always, he, I feel like he always begins in a very sort of like dramatic way. He'd be like, so YouTube, what what's going on there? You know, yes. like that kind of thing. Like just very uh, makes everything seem extremely grand and purposeful. Which, of course, uh, so much of what I do with my life is not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, like I, I mentioned to you, when he gets artists on there, like I, I usually obviously i don't like go out seeking charlie rose interviews it just happens that some of the people that i'm interested in hearing interviews of he did them so mm. like uh david foster wallace and donna tart are you know these very artistically minded authors and it just seems like a total mismatch of personality when charlie rose is interviewing them uh but it is interesting also because it's like you have like a totally different viewpoint knocking them around a bit but it's also like yeah i feel like he misses the full appreciation for what they were doing uh mm -hmm. if you know what i mean it's like he is i don't know that he particularly got the the literature and like the you yeah. the things that they were doing but i don't know maybe he did and he was just putting on a big show for all of us so i definitely think that like you have to be and i i just, spoke to you about this before like I, I do think that like a host has to be willing to play a little dumb at times and and sort of allow the interviewee to kind of explain themselves rather than come at it in the way that I think Charlie Rose often does as if he already you know kind of like understands what they're all about and is going to sort of ask questions that sort of convey his depth of understanding of their work rather than sort of allowing you know sort of the the artist or the interviewee themselves to kind of be leading that particular conversation. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting in this particular context because, uh, you know, like for, for the big interviewers, there is like a pre existing knowledge that the audience will probably have, but for this level, uh, it's not entirely obvious that everyone will know, who you are, or who yeah. Jake is, or who Greg was, you know, and whoever, because it's like, you know, I'm not uh, interviewing, um, y you know, JK Rowling or whatever on here. So, yeah. uh, so then it's like, what, how do I do, how do I tread the line between making sure people know why they should care and also like not just making it this rote, kind of uh basic thing going through well, tell me about the this video you made although i probably you know i'm sure there are some videos <laughs> that i will ask you about that you have done recently that have been quite interesting um yeah there was there was really no question there i was just kind of going off and <laughs> I don't know the art of the art of a good interview it, it is an it is an art unto itself and there's a reason why uh you know so many people have failed to do it effectively you know despite the fact that we're living in an era where there's a true sort of preponderance of uh podcasts and interview shows on youtube and stream interviews and all of this other kind of stuff like it's still remains hard to do well and there's a reason why we still venerate you know the sort of the great uh, the great experts of the of the field you know so i don't know like i feel 
I kind of like wonder like who are the great interviewers of our time. I mean, like people like Joe Rogan's podcast a lot. I don't know if he's necessarily a man who exudes talent as an interviewer as opposed to a guy who's just good at getting guests on. Uh, yeah, because he's so popular. I mean, yeah, I'm not... it is interesting but, but because. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, but he, he, I think to the extent he is a good interviewer, he is, he is good at, at sort of doing the playing the dummy routine a bit. And I think the fact that he is comfortable sort of seeming like an, an idiot, you know, I say that yeah. with some affection, right? Like he'll ask kind of dopey questions and he'll say like, I need you to like dumb this down for me and that kind of thing. I, I think that is, that is useful. And I do prefer that overall to the, the kind of more high minded sort of snobby know it all Charlie Rose type. Yeah. And, he also like i don't listen to a ton of joe rogan it's the kind of thing where it's like i don't seek out joe rogan i just happen to listen to when i'm interested in the person that a lot of them end up on that podcast uh he is good at sort of getting out of the way and just letting the other person talk almost like mm -hmm. i imagine uh it, like a ball a soccer ball and Joe just knows when he needs to nudge it a little more to give some momentum for the guest to then take it the rest of the way. Like he's not really doing a lot of heavy lifting there where I feel like, uh, you know, less experienced uh, and or worse interviewers fe feel a lot of pressure to keep things going. Like they are the ones who are supposed to carry it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's re it really like, uh it's an opportunity for the guests to to talk about what they want to talk about and like you said uh it's also it, it's interesting a lot of a lot of what, <laughs> what we're going to talk about is like what you said in our conversation weeks ago uh it's uh a lot of times people who are being interviewed feel like they need to shut up so that they don't take over the mm. podcast whereas it's like that's the point though <laughs> he said yeah. as he went on and on <laughs> no it's true it's like you have to kind of i think both the interviewer and the interviewee uh in order to create a good interview have to kind of unlearn some sort of social conventions of standard communication because an interview is not a conversation between friends people often try to frame it as if that's i just want to have a nice sort of conversational vibe and that's that's true to a point but at the same time like you know an interview is hopefully being done primarily for the benefit of the audience and the audience's needs dictate certain different styles of sort of uh human to human communication interaction than you know just two friends meeting at a coffee shop might yeah which makes me think about an interesting thing when it comes to creating youtube videos is how some creators think about the audience a lot when they're making stuff and how some don't they just make whatever speaks to them how much does the audience come into play when you are making your videos mm. i think like, it would you, comes in do you think to to develop that a little bit more <laughs> yeah does it does it seem like a uh does it feel like kind of a dialogue between you and the audience like you put out something they respond to it you're like okay let's keep it going uh maybe not in the most literal way but you, you know, gen in general, or is it sort of just like, here's what's on my mind? Hmm. I guess I have a few thoughts on this topic, and it is sort of something I think about a fair bit. Um, on the one hand, I've always been very afraid of having too narrowly a transactional relationship with the audience in the sense where I feel like I've seen a lot of channels where the creator makes a video that really, you know, takes off. And then the creator's like, okay, I have sort of cracked the code. I have discovered what my audience wants. I'm just going to keep making that type of video forever and ever and ever. You know, I, there's an example. I remember I brought this up on another podcast once where there used to be this men's fashion channel I used to watch a lot. And then at one point he made a video where he just ordered a mystery box from eBay, like a mystery box of clothing from eBay. And then that video was a huge hit. And now to this day, all he does is mystery box videos. And once in a while, he'll try to do a video on some other topic and it will always tank because all the audience wants at this point is mystery box, mystery box, mystery box. And that's kind of frightening to me a little bit. And I would never want to have that happen to me to the point where I get so like sort of in a very narrow, uh, you know, 
uh, frame of content that I can't sort of ever experiment or or be creative because the audience will rebel. So like on the one hand, I, I don't want to get in that way. And so as a result, I don't tend to do a lot of videos that are necessarily inspired by the success of previous videos. I guess like the only exception is, is that I kind of have this series where I solve the flag mysteries that my viewers sometimes email me. And I do like maybe a couple of those a year, but you know, I've sort of resisted, you know, the idea that like I'm gonna do this every month or whatever. I do it when, you know, the inspiration sort of strikes. But then on the other hand, I do feel like a responsibility to my audience in a pretty profound way. You know, as I get older, <laughs> you know, I'm a man that's almost 40, I have have no children, and maybe there's sort of like a sort of paternalistic instinct that's coming out in me in pretty strong. So I do kind of feel like a strong obligation to make content that is good for my audience, that is helpful, and that provides them with knowledge that, you know, will make them a better person in some modest way, you know, that their lives will be better for knowing the kind of information that I'm providing to them. You know, I, I have primarily, it's an educational channel. I make videos about, you know, the world and facts and history and this sort of thing. You know, cultural literacy is, is a term that I, I use a fair bit, which is basically just the theory of that there's some amount of information and sort of fact-based knowledge that everybody should quote unquote know in order to be a sort of functioning member of democratic society. So I do kind of take that stuff pretty seriously as well. And like I said, it, it's somewhat sort of paternalistic in its nature, as opposed to being sort of purely, uh, you know, uh, sort of democratic, I guess you could say. Uh, in the sense of like, you know, just purely responding to audience uh, desires, because in some way I'm being a little, you know, because I'm older than a lot of my audience and I feel like I carry myself in a way where it's like, I'm comfortable making kind of judgment calls on what I think would be useful for them to know, what I think they would like, even if they might ne not necessarily articulate it, uh, articulate it themselves if I gave them a poll and I sort of said, well, what do you want to learn or whatever. And uh, the other sort of, the third sort of thing, I guess I would say, and maybe this sort of sounds grandiose, but it's like, I have a fair bit of confidence because I've been doing these videos for like seven years now. I have a fair bit of confidence that I would be able to make, you know, m the topic that I think is worth making a video about, like I have a fair degree of confidence that I would be able to make that compelling or engaging in some way to the audience. And I feel like the audience in turn like they trust me, they trust me to deliver on that kind of implicit promise. You know, I can make a video on any random topic, not any random topic, but you know, I can make a video on a wide variety of topics. And ultimately I've built up a kind of level of trust in the audience where the audience has faith that like, okay, I might not know anything about this topic going in, but JJ, you know, makes decent videos. He puts effort into it. He's a good communicator. He researches his subject matter well. And so I'm going to, I'm going to trust him and I'm going to click on this video uh, for that reason. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's trust based without necessarily being pandering, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, yeah, I've always thought that that was a, uh, amazing thing that you have with your channel, at least for, as an outsider, that's what it seems like is that the audience has a lot of trust in you because from week to week, the kind of content you make is very different. Like it's, it, it would be, almost impossible to predict what will JJ come out with next week because there are so many different topics that you feel comfortable dipping into. And yet it's not a, it, your audience isn't stratified where it's like, yeah, this video is only going to attract these people. This video is only going to attract these people. Now, certainly there are some that do better than others, but uh, overall it seems fairly consistent to me. Do you like, do when you're talking about, uh, like the, the topics you pick and it's for, uh, it's like, uh, to teach young people things that are important. How is that like a conscious thing that you put each idea through that you have for a video or is it more of an intuitive process where you're like, Oh, this seems like an important thing because there are some that are clearly, uh, very important for a young person to know, like a month ago you made, uh, a video, Don't Be Like Jack, which is mm. about a, a news story. That one was a very uh, pointed 
and uh, uh, frank discussion of that situation. But then a couple weeks later, you have a video about pizza. Yeah. So, and which is obviously full of interesting facts and, and the history of pizza, but it's like, there it seems like slightly different metrics. How much of a, how hard are you holding your feet to the fire in terms of what is important for people to know? And, uh, as opposed to just like, what's, what's interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I guess, you know, if your motive is primarily educational, which I feel like is my motive uh, when I'm making my videos, then you kind of have to have a sort of broad definition, I think, of what it means to be educated, what it means to receive a sort of complete education, a comprehensive education. You know, obviously, I'm by no means aspiring to be the only educational source that people learn from. But, you know, I do have a sort of broad ambition as far as that goes. And I do think that because the ambition is broad, you have to be willing to uh, sort of explore uh, educational topics in a diverse uh, number of ways. So in the video that you referred to, the, the video I made about Jack Teixeira, the boy that leaked the, uh, you know, the classified intelligence documents, you know, that was that was a kind of like more kind of explicitly sort of paternalistic video where I was sort of in, you know, my own small way, hopefully providing some sort of life advice to my my young audience and talking about, you know, what, how I sort of thought that Jack Teixeira sort of failed himself, but was also sort of failed by society, perhaps in some sort of broad way, or, you know, talking about the problems of radicalization online and sort of lack of you know, adult oversight of a lot of young people these days. And, you know, that was something that I felt strongly about. And I feel like it's hopefully it was a message that was worth listening to. The audience responded pretty positively to that. But then, you know, when I'm making my video on the history of pizza, like I'm not making that from a purely sort of frivolous motive uh, in contrast, you know, like I'm making that video because I think that understanding the history of pizza is a sort of entry point to understanding, say, the history of immigration to America, the way that immigrants have contributed to American culture. You know, obviously, pizza, we tell the story of Italian immigrants. You know, we learn about the way that sort of mass media and sort of post-war habits of consumption and technology have influenced sort of American culture, which is heavily bound up in, in consumerism. I'm not a critic of consumerism. I actually think that the, the history of consumerism and the degree that consumerism has sort of affected the, the texture of American life is a story that is worth telling and, and even worth sort of celebrating to some degree. And, you know, I think that all of that knowledge that's kind of infused in learning the history of pizza is relevant knowledge and is knowledge that is relevant to becoming a sort of culturally literate sort of functional uh, member of, of American society, of Western society in, in general, you could say. So I really do try not to make content that is that is frivolous, that is completely uh, irrelevant. Like I, I try to always have a sort of strong thesis for why I'm making a video on this topic. And, you know, maybe I don't say it explicitly in the video itself, but I would hope that uh, when the viewer has gone through the experience, they feel like that they've learned something that is in some way substantial but yeah it's not you know is is learning about sort of the the history of a major american food stuff and what that represents about sort of american culture american sort of cultural evolution in terms of yeah marketing and media and you know the, why some fruits and vegetables are more common in the american diet than others you know is that knowledge equivalent to the knowledge of of fighting the importance of fighting radicalization online I don't know if those things are necessarily parallel, but I think that they both matter and they matter in, uh, in, in, in important ways. Well, at the very least, like if you zoom out enough, I think one of the, the things, the, the place on the Venn diagram where they cross is that it's taking, it's shining light on something and saying, don't take, this for granted whatever it is mm. like there's a story behind it like with, with well with pizza it's like hey this is something that you grow up with they just assume it's you know a food item maybe you learn a little bit about it and you're like oh it's italian or whatever by learning the backstory it's like you you understand like where did where did we come from to get to the domino's pizza being delivered to me it's like there was a lot behind it it, it makes it so you don't take it for granted as much. 
uh, or at the very least, it's like you can appreciate it more than uh, you had been. Whereas with uh, the Jack T Teixeira case, it's like uh, you talk about how all in that video, you talk about how uh, he was in an online community with a bunch of teenagers, essentially. And correct me if I get anything wrong yeah. here. Um, and they were just kind of like closed off and it was like, you know, this incubation of their own uh, misinformation or whatever. And in general, in that video, you were talking about how these online communities just get very kind of isolated and it's in some ways a feedback loop. And, you know, the idea there is like, you shouldn't take these things for granted, like open up your mind, look at the history of, of the things that you're you're uh, taking for granted, look at what the actual facts are. Learn to appreciate uh, what you have, the stories behind mm. them. Mm. So, mm. Uh, I mean, if that would you say that's a, <laughs> a fair yeah. Asset, I mean, it's easier for me to make that argument for the pizza one for the uh, for the for the Jack no, I think, I think one. Well, I think you're onto something for sure. Like, I definitely think that like. You know, I think that gratitude is very important. And I do think that, like, you know, when you look at the story of, of, of Jack Teixeira, you saw a lot of young uh, men in his sort of Discord uh, group who were in some ways not grateful uh, for what, you know, sort of the society that they were a part of. You know, there's a lot of pessimism in American culture today. You know, on both the right wing and the left wing, I feel like if you're not careful, you know, you can be very easily sold a lot of, uh, you know, propaganda about how America is just this dreadful, horrible, imperialistic, failed state and just really overheated rhetoric that just make it sound like it's like the worst experience in the world to be an American. You're just why live in this horrible you know, terrible <laughs> country and all this kind of stuff, right? I'm, I'm, I'm striving hard not to swear, Frank, because I know you're not a big fan of swearing on the old podcast. Oh, well, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but like, you know, fine. like there's, you know, like there's, there's this argument that, like, you know, and again, like you hear it from both the right and the left that America is just this, this, this shitty country. Basically, there's no better yeah. way to put it. And, and so as a result, like that to me is like a profound kind of like almost like a kind of like very sort of spoiled, uh, self-centered sort of attitude because America is, is a very great country to live in and and you know there's problems with American society no one would ever doubt that but America is by no means a failed state and you can disagree with American foreign policy but you know in my opinion it is you know generally being done in the best interests of you know global peace and security and all of this kind of stuff and uh, you know America is still a great uh, you know leader of the kind of Western alliance, and a lot of countries are very happy to have America in that sort of leadership position. And I think that when you sort of allow yourself to kind of swallow a bunch of conspiracy theories and anti-American kind of propaganda that presents the opposite as being true, as Jack Teixeira and you know his crew bought into from a kind of more right-wing sort of perspective that America is just you know this kind of hegemon that's trying to enslave the world and lies to its people and everything American foreign policy does is wicked and dishonest and imperialistic and you know led by some shadowy cabal that hates the American people and that kind of stuff like that's I don't know like that's that is a lack of gratitude if you ask me like that is just a desire to be a victim a desire to kind of like wallow in a kind of self-loathing and self-hatred and just sort of, I don't know, conspiratorial belief systems that are often, and again, like, and the other thing is that they're informed by ignorance. Like they're informed by a lack of genuine curiosity about how America actually works, how power, you know, is actually distributed, how decisions are actually made, you know, how the military hierarchy and the political hierarchy actually works. Like the kind of stuff that like, if you had any genuine interest in any of this kind of stuff beyond a kind of, uh, you know, desire to just reinforce a couple of simplistic sort of conspiracy theories that, you know, you're very loyal to because they're, they're sort of sensationalistic and sort of satisfying in, in their sort of simplicity and kind of uh, Hollywood, you know, kind of, you know, stark hero and villain kind of dynamic. Like, if you actually have an interest in learning, then I think that that is one of the best cures to that kind of radicalization that makes you do you know, idiotic things like leak classified government documents and put the lives of American intelligence workers and the life of uh, American allies, and you know, in this case, in the Ukrainian war in, in danger. So I definitely think that like, 
ignorance is one of the great scourges of our time, particularly in the internet age, particularly uh, when it comes to, to young people and the kind of diet of information a lot of young people are consuming. So, you know, in my own small way, I, I and certainly more and more as I get older and as I do the YouTube thing more and more, I'm starting to feel like, you know, an obligation that I have, a responsibility I have is to kind of fight ignorance. And one way I can fight ignorance is by making, you know, educational, informative videos that are in some ways appealing to, to young people and provide an alternative to some of the, uh, you know, some of the crappier uh, media that I think a lot of uh, young people are, are consuming elsewhere. Do you think that your channel, like, what is the specific void, I guess, that it is filling in? Because there's, you know, several educational, several, there's you know, hundreds of educational <laughs> channels yeah. on YouTube. Uh, when you look out at those other ones, what do you say that you, what would you say that you are doing that they aren't doing? Or even if it's just like the way you do it or the the style you bring to it, obviously there's like the the intangible of you and the things that you are drawn to, your opinions, et cetera, your viewpoint. Uh, what would you say is the the unique spin that you're bringing as opposed to, uh, you know, whatever whatever other educational channels might be out there? And, and uh, feel free if you, you know, if there is, a, if there are channels out there that uh, you feel like get too much exposure, you feel like uh, <laughs> these are irritating because they get things wrong all the time, they're helping keep people ignorant or whatever feel free to trash them let's start some controversy <laughs> right here well i don't want to i've kind of resisted sort of picking fights with with other channels although i am pretty critical of a lot of other educational channels you know i, I do think a lot of other educational channels you know because i don't want to say that they're they're ignorant but perhaps their interest in a lot of the topics is is somewhat is somewhat superficial which then leads them to tell a kind of superficial story when they're seeking to, you know, tell you the history of, of this, that, or the other thing, you know, they read the, the Wikipedia article, you know, I really dislike Wikipedia as anybody who follows me will know, you know, they sort of read the Wikipedia article. That's about all the work that they do. They kind of credulously just kind of regurgitate it. And there's no real sort of like depth of analysis. There's no kind of like making connections between their story they're telling and in some other kind of like larger story. Uh, you know, like, for example, like, if I'm telling the story of, of pizza, right, you know, I can read a book about pizza and, like, learn some interesting things about it. But, you know, I also have some pre-existing knowledge and I can kind of, like, draw connections and I can say, okay, well, you know, pizza was sort of being developed in the early 20th century. You know, what else was going on in America at that time? You know, what was happening it, sort of in the economic space and sort of the political space, the technology space? And, you know, I can kind of and then hopefully use that kind of pre-existing knowledge I have to do a little bit deeper analysis and an analysis that's kind of informed by my own knowledge rather than just, you know, the secondary source or whatever that I'm reading that gives me their kind of spin and their kind of summary of, of what of what's gone on. Like, I definitely think that analysis is very critical. Like, it's not good enough to just kind of summarize the facts of the situation, although the facts are obviously very important. But you also have to be willing to help your audience make the connections, you know? Like, for example, one of the videos that I'm, I'm very proud of that I made was, like, the history of, of like, candy in American culture, specifically uh, fruit candy. And mm -hmm. uh, you can read, you know, books about the history of candy or more likely articles online about the history of candy. And there's a very, you know, kind of point by point all oh, you know in the 20th century candy started being popular and then there was candy stores and you know this company was invented in this year and that kind of thing but you know in the video that i made i, I tried to st tell the story where it's like well you know the story of of american candy is in part the story of how sugar became a very mainstream product in in american life and you know that's a product of you know it's a product of slavery it's a product of you know uh sort of trade with the sort of the sugar colonies in the caribbean and and elsewhere it's also a story of uh you know when we get into the fruit flavor sort of side of things it's a story of how new agriculture uh policies sort of fostered a development of of fruits and vegetables that had previously not been very common in the american diet you know there was a great orange boom in uh, california and florida in the latter half of the 19th century there was new technology in in terms of refrigerated uh, train cars that were able to deliver fresh fruits to the east that then sort of 
help popularize those foods in that part of the uh, country. And then that led to candies being created to emulate these very desirable fruit flavors and, and this kind of thing. Like it's just, I and I feel like that desire to kind of like tell a broader story and to make connections in a way that like perhaps other, you know, people have not done. And like, you know, for example, like when I made that fruit candy video, there wasn't like a single book that I read that was like the history of American fruit candies and how it relates to patterns and, you know, the popularity of fruits and all this kind of thing. Like I read books about the history of sugar. I read books about the history of candy. I read books about the history of fruit and then, you know, and, you know, American consumerism, the industrial revolution, whatever. And then I make all the connections together and I say, aha, here is an interesting story that I can tell about all of these things. And I just kind of feel like that's sometimes something that other creators don't do. And uh, the other thing I would say as well is to be is to be skeptical. And it's funny because I was thinking about this, like when I hit a million subs, which will hopefully happen someday, um, I was thinking about making like a video where I just kind of like talk about some of the big things that I've learned through the process of making so many educational videos. And one thing that I've learned is that we should always be like very skeptical of these little cute stories that are just too perfect, you know? like the story of the uh, i'm sure you can probably think of examples of stories like this but you know like i did a video where i talked about potato chips and there's like this little cute story about how you know potato chips were invented in this restaurant in ohio where like the guy sent back the french fries and the cook was so angry that he cut them super thin and then gave them back to the the sort of the complaining uh restaurant uh, patron and then the restaurant patron was delighted and that's how chips were invented and like you know stories like this like there's a lot of these kind of like cutesy stories that i feel are very uncritically repeated ad nauseum uh everywhere online including on educational youtube channels but i often come at these kind of stories with a degree of skepticism and i'm often i want to like look more carefully at some of the origin stories of things or some of the famous anecdotes that are just repeated again and again. Because I think that often when you look closely at them, you find that there's big holes in the stories or that serious historians have called them into question. And sometimes the reality of the, of the history is very ambiguous. And I feel like I'm okay with ambiguity and I trust my audience to be okay with ambiguity. And I'm, I like telling them that like, well, you know, we don't really know where this came from and there's a lot of possibilities and, and that kind of stuff. But a lot of other, I think, educational uh, YouTubers or content makers more broadly, the second they hear a cute, like, just so story, they will run with it and, and because it just makes a, a tidier narrative. And, and But I think that, you know, the real world doesn't work that way. The real world is, is messy and confusing and ambiguous. And I think you sometimes have to be able to tell those kind of stories, even if maybe it makes uh, the script writing a little bit more challenging. Well, yeah, it's, you're not, you're not just regurgitate, like you said, you're not just regurgitating facts. You're not just taking a synth, you're not just making a synthesis of all these other secondary sources and being like, here's how they all agree. What I, what your videos do that I think is unique there is making a thesis and putting together, you know, connecting these dots that uh, haven't obviously been connected in other places or if they have been it's not like necessarily what is accepted as you know the truth the way th or the the facts it's like your opinion of how the facts all fit together how th how these histories interplay with each other uh etc uh mm -hmm. it's interesting because you you made a video where you talked about cultural literacy and uh, talking about the whole thing of people saying we shouldn't teach kids what to think, we should teach them how to think. And your point, uh, which I, you know, I think would be interesting to elaborate on, and which I think is relevant to what we've been talking about so far, is that you can't you can't learn how to think unless you are actually learning what to think, like unless you, unless you are actually learning facts. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think this is very important. Uh, this is, uh, I've been very influenced by a guy called E.D. Hirsch, who is sort of the founder of the theory of cultural literacy. And, you know, he's a very old man now. I was actually just listening to a podcast. He's like 95 or something, but still pretty with it. And he's, he keeps repeating this, this thesis, which he's been repeating his whole life. And, it's basically just that, like, unless you have factual knowledge, 
you cannot begin the process of thinking critically about anything. Like you have to begin with some base level of understanding of the realities of the world. And only then can you start sort of engaging uh, in a sort of skeptical or sort of inquisitive uh, way. Because otherwise, actually, and you know, again, this goes back to like, say, the Jack Teixeira story and sort of the young men in, in kind of his orbit, right? Like, if you know nothing about how the American government works or how the military works or how, you know, foreign policy decisions are made because you haven't studied history, you haven't read, you know, any books about presidential administrations or, you know, the great foreign policy decisions of the past, you know, if you're, if you're so ignorant in that way, then when you try to apply the lens of critical thinking, you're basically just being critical and skeptical and, you know, suspicious in the absence of any real knowledge to build upon. So as a result, that's, I think, when sort of the conspiratorial kind of frame of mind grows, because then you just kind of like use simplistic uh, cliches, sort of broad sort of generalizations, like, well, the elites always lie to us, or the elites hate us, and the, you know, the uh, sort of the foreign policy establishment is just trying to, you know, rule the world and enslave everybody and this kind of thing. Like, these are just kind of like broad cliches that are kind of a substitution for knowledge. And there's a certain sort of person, you know, that will sort of like nod, uh, you know, in a sort of agreeable fashion, because this kind of stuff sounds plausible, you know, and perhaps it's kind of like reinforced by the kind of themes that we see in 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 Hollywood movies and, you know, novels and stuff like that. But it's not really based on any sort of substantial uh, information. And I think that like the more substantial information you you acquire, you know, the more you realize that, uh, the, you know, <clears throat> things in this world often don't work in in such a simple way. Like there often is a lot of of, of nuance and complexity to uh, to situations. But then, you know, as well, like having more uh, literacy in terms of just sort of like broad factual knowledge allows you to also uh, engage much more deeper in in sort of sort of substantial topics when it comes to, you know, say, learning about the history of food or learning, you know, why we have certain traditions in, in our culture and why other cultures might have have different traditions. Like it all comes back to just do you have a certain stable base of knowledge, do you know, basic facts about the economy? Do you know basic facts about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, how, um, how the government works, how the military yeah. works, how, how, you know, the various products that define our daily life, you know, how, how, uh, how production cycles of things like, like food or metal or, uh, you know, clothing or whatever you or agriculture right like all of these kinds of things like unless you have some base level of knowledge uh that becomes a kind of like i don't know like a sort of like solid block in your mind that new information either penetrates or bounces off of if that metaphor <laughs> makes any sense like if yeah. you don't have that kind of like solid foundation in my opinion like it's just very easy for you to be a rube and to fall for you know, ideas that simply appeal to your emotions and these kind of like broad kind of emotional appeals to what feels right or seems right or seems plausible in a kind of, you know, uh, sort of simplistic way. Yeah, well, it's like if there is a void of information in a person's brain, then whatever easy information comes by uh, will fill it you know, will stick. So if yeah, mm -hmm. someone doesn't know much about whatever it is, and there is a conspiracy theory that gives a nice, tidy answer with a bow on it, and you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. seems yeah. good enough for me. Now I'm and it also, like you said, uh, I have an emotional response, it makes me afraid. So if I don't believe yeah. this, then I'm gonna open myself up to, you know, being taken advantage of or from something bad happening. And uh, yeah, even just like it, it's like even the basic things, even stuff like learning where the, the origins of pizza, all these things come together to build up this idea of history, of reality, of where everything came from, uh, what everything is. And even though there's like no conspiracy theories surrounding pizza, I do feel like <laughs> learning. Well, there is. There learning, is. There's pizza gate, right? <laughs> oh yeah well uh, learning uh, in general learning w a wide variety yeah. of of info 
will you know help guard against those kind of things uh I do want to switch radically the topic we're talking about because you mentioned production cycles and we've talked a little bit, uh, you know, in our convos about production prod psychs, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, one of the themes of this podcast is talking to YouTubers about creativity, about how like the nuts and bolts of their behind the scenes stuff. And uh, you do everything by yourself for your channel, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I have, you know, I write the scripts myself, which I know a lot of YouTubers don't do. You know, I uh, research the stuff myself. I I do like 90% of the editing myself. Uh, I do have a, an editor that I actually, you gave him a shout out, shout out to Ty, as yeah, you did in the yeah. last episode. So like, Thanks, Ty. Uh, yeah, yeah. So like I do, I do. So like I always film on, so like I finish my script on Monday and then on Tuesdays I film and I hate filming the most. It is by far like the part of the process that I loathe the most. And part of the reason why I loathe it so much is that I feel like I cannot deliver a take to save my life. So like I'm reading the script off of the teleprompter, uh, a technology that you introduced me to and I'm very grateful for. Uh, but you know, I still stumble over my lines all the time. So like every line in the script, like I record, I don't know, two or three or four or five times and uh, I send this sort of raw footage to uh, to old man Ty, and he basically extracts the best takes. You know, something that I used to do myself, but it was very time consuming. And you know how it is, like you don't trust your own judgment. Like it's like, oh, was mm -hmm. that take better than this take? And you notice all these subtle things and you drive yourself nuts trying to find the best take. So Ty does that for me and that's a, that's a huge help. And then I get the edited video back uh, from him on Thursday. And then I, I uh, add all of the sort of graphics and sound effects and razzle dazzle on, on all day Thursday, all day Friday. And increasingly, I'm sorry to say, uh, a lot of Saturday as well. It used to be my ambition to always post on Saturday, but now increasingly it's taking a great chunk of Saturday to get it done too. And sometimes I don't post until, you know, Sunday or even late Sunday. Lord help me. Now, when you but, say uh, you, you throw in the graphics, it's worth pointing out that you make like how how much of the graphics do you make like 75 percent of the the graphics you throw up in a in a video you made yeah i mean like i will use photos or video footage when necessary but a lot of the time a lot of the graphics in my videos are like you know like they're edited in various ways like it can be as simple as you know if i'm talking about like some historical figure or something i say a napoleon and you know i might have like a little cut out of napoleon's head and it might not look like much but you know to make a little cut out of napoleon's head i still have to go into photoshop and you know clean up all the pixels and isolate the head and maybe put a white border around it or whatever I mean, yeah, and sometimes I'll do even more complex things. Sometimes I'll do a, you know, I like to draw. So sometimes I'll like draw a whole scene to illustrate something or I'll make special graphics or little animations. And and it's all like, it's, it's, it's time consuming stuff. I like doing it. Like I like having videos that again, like just have, hopefully have that extra level of, of effort and attention and, uh, you know, just, yeah, effort to do it because I want that to be a sort of value add that my videos have that I'm not just, you know, grabbing the first image from Google image search, but I'm having an illustration that, you know, helps uh, communicate what I'm trying to explain in a way that's kind of fun and very clear. Clarity is like one of my most, one of my most valued uh, priorities when it comes to making my videos. So if I can get the best graphic, I will. And if the best graphic doesn't exist, then I will try to make it. Wow. Yeah. Clarity is key, especially when you're talking about like a lot of dense stuff to be able to illustrate it. Uh, it's that's the communication, what the communication needs. Now, one of the things you didn't mention in there, though, is the research. And you mentioned for one of them that for, you know, your video about uh, candy that you read all these books on different mm -hmm. subjects. So where does the research fit in? Are you like, how far are you like, while you're working on one video, you're also researching for another video. I'm starting to wonder when do you have time to do anything else except make <laughs> videos? Yeah, I man, I don't do a whole lot else except make videos, I'm sorry to say. I mean, I, you know, like these, these videos, like, I don't want to sort of 
pat myself on the back too much. I mean, these are, these are relatively <laughs> short. No, like these are like I make, you know, I, I'm proud of the videos I make, but you know, they're short and relatively superficial overviews. They're not like, you know, deep dives. Like, you know, my friend Knowing Better, great YouTuber, you know, he makes like these two hour long epic historical uh, you know, essays and they're extraordinarily well researched and he's like read entire books from cover to cover and you know, they're just they're just real masterpieces of sort of educational content. You know, he made a two hour video on uh, the history of Christian science the other day and it's just real masterpiece. But, uh, you know, so I'm not like not doing that. So like as much as I am researching and reading books and that kind of stuff, you know, I'm not reading the whole book from cover to cover. You know, I find the book. I, find the chapters that are about the topic that is relevant to the point uh, I want to make or the issue that I want to explore. And I read that and I put the book aside and I found ways to like read in, in a kind of like efficient and kind of purposeful way that sort of focuses on extracting the information in a kind of swift and, and way that doesn't sort of consume too much of, of my life. And, and, you know, again, like, and these videos are, they're kind of like broad overviews. I, I, again, like, I hope I make connections and I hope I'm communicating knowledge with some degree of, of insight and depth, but I'm also aware of like the limits of, of what I can reasonably expect to, to research and write within the course of just, you know, a week. I mean, it, it is true. Like I am, uh, like if the video is kind of ambitious enough in scope, I am sort of working on it little bits in the background here and there, for example, like, uh, I'm working on a video right now where I'm talking about the history of apple sandwiches, steak and milk, these four kind of like very iconic foods. And, you know, I don't know when that video is going to be done or even when I'm going to write the script, but you know, in my spare time, I've been kind of casually reading this book about the history of milk. I've been listening to this audio book about the history of apples. You know, I've ordered a book on the history of steak. I was reading a, an ebook the other day when I was eating dinner about the history of sandwiches. So, you know, I'm, I'm just doing little bits here and there in the background. And sometimes I'll start writing a script on my phone when I'm out walking. Uh, you know, I like to go for walks in the morning and in the evening. And I'm often, you know, kind of like doing, I guess this is making me sound pretty, pretty, pretty workaholic in some ways, but I don't know. It's like, this is the kind of stuff that, that provides a lot of sort of meaning to my life. And, and I do enjoy it. I, I like learning on its own terms. Like <laughs> I remember once hearing an interview actually with, uh, with good old Martha Stewart on the, uh, on the Larry King show. And she expressed uh -huh. like this desire, like that she just loves learning so much. And I remember her once saying that like, you know, some days she'd be like driving home and she'd realize I haven't learned anything today. And she'd like stop by the bookstore and just like grab a random book off the shelf and just like scan the page. Ah, I've learned something. Okay, this day was worth it, you know? And I kind of feel that same sort of compulsion. Like learning is just, is such a satisfying thing. And I feel like it's, it's making me a better person and it's making me a better person in relation to my ability to help others. And so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great source of joy. So the research is sort of just an extension of what you would do anyway, yeah. if you weren't yeah. making yeah. YouTube videos. So in that, in that yeah. sense, it's like not really work. It's not really effort. Uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, if I draw an analogy to my own line of work, very scientific study of uh, personality types. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of what I do to learn about types is basically just to study people like it's not any, and it's something I would have done anyway. It's just the, mm -hmm. there's the added thing of like trying to think, uh, thinking a little bit more about what they say, but it's not like I'm sitting down and be like, oh, okay, here I go. Let me yeah. figure out what's going on with this person, you know? <laughs> uh, no, exactly. Yeah. One thing that I thought of is you're doing the history of steak. You know, JJ, as a vegetarian, are you going to like <laughs> eat some steak as part of your research or is this going to be like a total, an outsider's view of steak? I don't know. It's a good question, isn't it? Because I like I like to have sort of uh, tactile props often when I make videos. And I was kind of thinking like, you know, I for my pizza video, I don't know if this is like scandalous is in terms of my vegetarianism, but like I was waving around a slice of pizza and it was like a pepperoni pizza, which I bought because, you know, I know that that's like the most iconic sort of uh, type of pizza. But then I was like, oh, man, have I like compromised my my ethics by buying this meat based pizza, even if I'm not going to eat it, even if I'm just kind of like waving it around on camera. I'm thinking about that, like if I was to have like a steak and like, here's what a steak looks like or whatever. And if it's just, 
I don't know. I mean, I have I have memories of eating steak. I, I've been vegetarian for for like twelve years or something, but uh, I can definitely remember it. I remember eating a ate a horse steak in in Luxembourg once. That's oh my gosh! Favorite, <laughs> favorite weird things to bring up, but uh, yeah. Wow, that, that just imagine like your next video is like I ate horse. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the title. Yes, yes. I mean, you, I, I'm sure that would get a lot of views if you just did a video like that, just told the story. But is being a vegetarian is that like an ethical thing with you know animal welfare, or is it more of a health thing, or is it just more of like I don't really like meat. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit of everything. I mean, definitely, like it didn't start off from a place of grand principle. You know, I'm 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 pretty big into kind of self denial as a lifestyle. You know, I've never had alcohol before. I've never had coffee before. Uh, I've always just kind of like restricted my intake of of certain things that I kind of felt were just kind of bad on some level. I guess I don't really like the idea of of chemical stimulants on some level. But you know, at some point, it was just kind of like, oh well, I've abstained from these things for so long. Maybe I could abstain from meat too. Like maybe that could become part of my lifestyle in addition to being like you know a self righteous teetotaler and <laughs> you know abstainer from caffeine. Maybe I could also be a self righteous vegetarian just for its own sake, just as another thing to not do. But then you know, as I've not eaten meat for many years, I've uh, I guess I've sort of become a little bit more partial to the animal rights things. Uh, you know, I've, I've learn more about that and you know in the course of making my videos and stuff where a lot of it is like food history and you realize kind of the conditions in which a lot of our of our meat products are are made you know this kind of great drive to efficiency which is i think you know the history of a lot of the kind of the history of of american culture is, is a sort of drive for greater and greater efficiency through modern technology and you know in a lot of ways when it comes to the making of you know candies or bread or cereal or a lot of other kinds of food products or clothing or electricity or whatever like this drive for technological efficiency is has been a real miracle and has helped build the american middle class and a kind of middle class lifestyle that we all take for granted and enjoy but when it comes to meat products i think that that drive for efficiency and the use of modern technology has created quite sort of dystopian uh, outcomes when it comes to things like like factory farming and and that and so i I do sort of in a kind of low key way, like I'm not going to any PETA rallies or anything like that anytime soon, but it, it, it does sort of strike me as the way that we produce and consume meat seems kind of broadly wrong and does sort of seem like something that I imagine we will probably look back at, you know, say a hundred years from now when we're all eating lab grown ethically sourced meat or whatever and say, you know, this was kind of grotesque and weird and it was strange that we kind of just collectively didn't really think about this for so long or put it out of our minds when it was objectively a very weird and troubling and morally dubious practice yeah where does the where do you think the the self-denial bit comes in like is that uh part uh, is that like a, a stoic philosophy that you have uh internalized is that just something that you were you were brought up with is it uh a reaction maybe to something else that you see in the culture like what because you know like you could take you could keep going with it like you you could uh there you know some people they sleep on the floor once a week or so just to you know what if i lost my bed that kind yes. of thing like how <laughs> Where where does it come from? Do you see yourself uh, taking it farther or are you like ah, just alcohol caffeine meat uh, i'm good I don't know. It's 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 kind of a curious thing. I mean, like, I so I don't I don't want to sort of maybe like psychoanalyze this too much or get sort of too grandiose about this. But it's like you know, like I'm I'm gay, right? And I grew up at a time that was relatively you know quite homophobic and created I think a lot of sort of confused uh, sort of issues with my own identity. And apparently, I've heard this that uh, some sort of gay men of, of my generation and earlier generations have what they call kind of best little boy in the world syndrome, where it's because mm -hmm. like you have some degree of like confusion or even sort of low-key self-loathing that you try to compensate for that 
by just being like the perfect like good kid, the kid who follows all of the rules and does everything absolutely right. And you know, you have some sort of like weird kind of sense that this will sort of redeem you in some way. And I could see like an element of that being part of my identity. I don't know ne if necessarily if it derives directly from my homosexuality or something else. But like definitely from a young age, I definitely remember like really wanting to be the good kid and to do everything right and to follow all of the rules. And and so from, you know, like a young age, you know, you remember growing up in the 80s, right? We were bombarded with a lot of like, you know, quite extreme propaganda about how bad it was to smoke or drink or do drugs and all of this kind of thing. And I internalized that and I kind of thought that, you know, I was going to be a good kid that was never going to do those sorts of things. And I never did. And even when it became kind of cool to do those sorts of things in, in high school, I was still very righteous and proud that I was abstaining from these things. And then eventually I became an adult that had just never done these things. And then it sort of started to kind of get a momentum onto itself. You know, I guess like some of it comes, I, I guess part of this, it makes me really sort of uh, buy into this argument. I'm sure you've heard this argument before, like that if you want to uh, sort of develop a, a, a certain habit, you need to sort of come up with a narrative about yourself where it's sort of bound up in your identity. Like I am a person that does X or I am a mm. person that doesn't do Y, right? And I guess like at some point, uh, the fact that I've been able to abstain from these things for so long is because I made it part of my identity rather early on. Like, and now it's just kind of part of my identity that is so inseparable from who I am that I don't even really sort of think to philosophize about it too much. It's just, I'm JJ. I've never had alcohol or, or coffee. Uh, I haven't had meat in like a dozen years. And this is just who I am. This is just part of, of, of the guy that I am in the same way that, you know, like I'm a white guy with crazy hair and mustache and gay and Canadian and all these other qualities. Like they're just part of my identity. And I guess there's a point at which you don't really sort of think to second guess parts of your identity that feel this deeply ingrained. Yeah. Well, it is interesting though, because the mustache wasn't there a month ago. So that's like a part of your identity <laughs> that, true. that comes and goes. It does come and you go. Know. Yeah. Who knows what JJ we're gonna get in a couple months? Might might be clean shaven. <laughs> Have you ever done the full beard? I don't think I can really grow a full beard. Like it, it doesn't ah. kind of come in. It's weird because my mustache does come in is really thick, and yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. it's my my icon. But yeah, beard no, yeah. not so much. I can relate. Like I can get good like mutton chops and a, a <laughs> decent mustache but they don't really connect and then the the chin is a little weak for me so it's more like a chin <laughs> strap here uh listen you know i i asked that question because and you know I, i'll be i want to be respectful of your time so we'll wrap it up and i got some uh, some ending questions to throw your way that i bet you'll never anticipate oh, um <laughs> But I, you know, uh, and you, you were the, uh, an er, you were the way we met was on the podcast. Like I watched your videos back in 2019. That's when I discovered your channel. I was like, wow, JJ's cool. I reached out to you, got you on the podcast. You're the first repeat guest, the no first lie. guest who was able to come overcome the trauma of being on the show one time enough to <laughs> go on a second time. Uh, and I really resonated with your videos because I just felt like you and I had in some ways like a similar upbringing, a similar outlook on life, despite the fact that we were different countries, different coasts. Uh, and the bit about like wanting to always follow the rules and be a, a good kid, I totally relate to that. And as I got older, I did have kind of like the even uh, like I when I was in college, like everyone drank uh, underage, but I was always very like, no, I'm going to follow the rules. I'm not 21. I'm not going to drink. Mm. Uh, and then I guess once I turned 21, maybe it's just because, uh, you know, in uh, whatever surrounding factors, I was just like, ah, you know what? It, it's legal now. <laughs> and so I've always felt like that self-denial bit wanting to do it but i haven't always uh followed it in various things ver th those various ways i eat meat you know i have a cigar every once in a while i drink tons yeah, of coffee um i haven't had any alcohol this year though so that's uh that's been a, a 
a good change because I like uh, my mind is so much more creative. Like it's so it's it's the dumbest thing ever to drink alcohol. Like it's there's no positive. But uh, I guess the point is like my self denial comes from. I guess a religious upbringing in some ways where it's like, I need to deny myself because if you don't, then it's like, God's going to get you <laughs> one day. Like yeah. I, maybe that's not, you know, obviously it's not what the Bible says or whatever, literally, but that's like the message that was somehow instilled in me is that basically the other shoe is going to drop one day. So it's like, you should deny, you, you know, live in that self-denial because then it'll turn out better in the long run. Or maybe it's just like, you know, I feel like I should be denying myself these things because one day they won't be available and then I won't miss it anymore. You know, like I should, mm. I should be okay with sleeping on the floor because one day I might not have a bed, <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's, that's why I asked the question. I do. Uh, it's interesting because it might be because you you weren't raised particularly religiously right no no i wasn't although i guess you could sort of say that i was raised in a pretty conservative household where things like you know following the rules obeying authority and not questioning stuff was was pretty was pretty drilled into me which is you know it's you know so i feel like i I got a lot of the same sort of moral lessons, but maybe in a kind of like more sort of secular context. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But it, it is true now you bring it up. Like in the 90s, it was drilled hard. I mean, maybe it's the same now. It's like, just say no, no to drugs, no to smoking. Yeah, You're yeah. going to die from all these yeah. things. Like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it, uh, it was a scary time to go to school. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so a few closing questions here. Uh, you, you've you heard the podcast, so you know, but uh, I'm looking for ideas, like little pithy lines that you might have that you could put maybe on an index card or something where if, if you or someone is stuck creatively, you're making a YouTube mm-hmm. video, you're or whatever creative thing you're doing, or even if it's like not artistic, like you're, some kid is writing an essay for college and they're stuck. Uh, what's the question? Like just a simple question that you would put on a card they could pull that would maybe jostle their mind, get the creative juices flowing a little bit. Um, I don't know if I would phrase it as a question as much as like, I do think like one of the best pieces of advice, and I bring this up all the time. It's like my, always my go-to piece of advice a piece of advice is just that like not everything you create has to express every thought you've ever had on that subject so i kind of just think that like like i suppose if i was to phrase it as a question like just kind of think like what can i say another time like what can i put off to another day because i definitely think that sometimes when we're getting sort of like creatively like frustrated or overwhelmed it's because we're trying to do too much and because we're trying to create something that is like the perfect little encapsulation of, of, of you know, certainly like in my space, like a, a subject matter that we're trying to engage with in a kind of like educational kind of way. So I think like you have to be willing to sort of give yourself the permission to just kind of say like, I don't have to do this now. I don't have to do everything now. If, if I can't find a way to incorporate this aspect of the topic into this video or whatever else I'm making, well then maybe I'll, I'll put it away. And like, you have to be able to ask yourself like, what doesn't need to be said, right? Like it's where, where being too comprehensive can be uh, can be a real scourge of 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 creativity and an ability to uh, to complete things. That's really great, and you know it's uh, it's great because you uh, you know Mike uh, I had three different ones: a question, a statement, and, a, and an invitation. So you've given me the question and the statement. I think <laughs> especially what what doesn't need to be said is especially good a good way to put that for a question because that could apply to anything uh and it's ba- it basically comes down to like what how do i get to the heart of what i'm trying to say and cut the yeah. extraneous stuff yeah yeah uh, it's yeah. It, let me, it's, it's yeah go ahead no let me let me give you like a metaphor because like i, I sometimes think about this a lot because it's like so like i like to draw 
I like to draw caricatures of people in particular. And uh, one of the things that when it comes to sort of like capturing the likeness of a person, less is often more. Like if you can use fewer lines rather than more lines, you will often be surprised at how much more accurate your, your portrayal of somebody is. But a lot of sort of younger artists or less experienced artists sort of suffer under the opposite delusion where it's like, I have to draw more, add more lines, more detail, more cross hatching, more this and that and that. And it just makes the picture look messy and you know, it, it communicates the information a lot worse. So I think that there's a certain like economics of, of information, a certain restraint that is often counterintuitively more effective when you're you know, holding yourself back a little bit. Yeah. I, I, that's a, a great analogy. What would be an invitation, which could also you look at it as like a command, but I, I call it an invitation because it's a little more soft, like a, a, an imperative that you would put on a card. Uh, you could call it a suggestion, I guess, too. something that kind of calls the person to action. And, mm. you know, like, like I said on the last podcast, it could be something as literal as take a walk or it could be something more abstract that's, you know, one of the one of the ones I came up with is throw your diamonds into the sea, which is sort of like a way of saying kill your darlings, which is yeah. something Stephen yeah. King said. Kill your kill your darlings is, I think, very good advice in general. I mean, I think it very much relates to uh, to the previous point I was making. I actually I have this technique. It's It's very funny because, you know, like I'm I'm as vain and self-important as anybody. And so when I'm writing my script, it's like, oh, every word is precious and I could never cut anything. And to like delete a paragraph that I've spent so much time working on is is so painful. Uh, so I, I've done this kind of like interesting psychological trick where it's like, I will never delete paragraphs. I just cut them and then I paste them into a different document. So for every script, I always have, you know, like it's the pizza script. And then I have another file that's called like pizza scrap. And then anything <laughs> I cut out, I just put into the pizza scrap folder. And then because like psychologically, it sort of tells me it's like, okay, like I'm saving this for like the future, right? But it becomes kind of like the leftover that's like never opened up again, right? Like there's just, we have a kind of like aversion to throwing things away, particularly throwing things away that we believe, uh, you know, have some inherent worth because we have created them ourselves. So definitely like, like kill your darlings is I think important, but if you can't muster the strength to kill your darlings, then uh, you know just put your darlings into the deep freeze and then forget and lock the cabinet. But uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, <clears throat> but other than that as well, like I I don't know if this really sort of falls into the uh, into the category of what of what you're describing, but I definitely like always think like at least for me like I think like think about like the importance of like helping people and like making other people's lives better through whatever it is that you're making. And, you know, that can be interpreted in a kind of broad way, but just like, I don't know, like come at it from a kind of empathetic perspective, from a perspective of, of caring and consideration and thoughtfulness and, and, you know, like just put your mind in, 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 into the needs of, of others and, and just don't get too self-involved and don't think about it all as it relates to you. Think about how it relates to the, to the audience and what you can do to make, you know, to, to educate them or entertain them or, or, you know, brighten their, their day a little bit, like just be a little bit selfless, like get out of your own mind. And I think that that helps me a bit because, you know, it's very easy to kind of get self-involved and self-important, but, the cause, the case for humility, as I think, is is something that a lot of us need to be uh, need to be reminded of. That's great. I really like that. Don't don't get too self involved. That's a good yeah. one. I think a lot of us creating whatever. It's like we forget the person who will be consuming it sometimes, and uh, that's always a good way to center yourself or a good way to be like no one cares <laughs> like no one's gonna yeah, notice the yeah. detail just whatever it doesn't matter yeah uh yeah, yeah. Well, jj we'll call it there uh this is okay. been a great discussion thanks uh thanks so much i appreciate your time thanks for having me frank it was great